welcome everyone to the official launch of Contagion, a 45-day exhibition season. We are living through an incredibly terrifying moment and we're all struggling to make sense of it. After having lived through it for a year, things seem to be going very differently. It is in that spirit of a commitment to public engagement with science, with the unstinting support of the government of Karnataka and the board of directors of Science Gallery Bengaluru, I'm very happy to bring to you Contagion. Science Gallery is, a, is an institution for research-based public engagement and Contagion is our first fully online exhibition season. Our first was Submerge, which was about a year ago, but that was physically held. Our content partners for this event are the Robert Koch Institute, and we are extremely proud to be associated with them on such an important endeavor. And I'm happy to say that Professor Lothar Wheeler, the president of the RKI, is amongst us today. And Professor Dale Sanders, the director of the John Inez Center, who we've also had the pleasure of working with on a previous exhibition, is also amongst us today. This exhibition has been curated with the help of a team in, with, international curate, uh, cult with the international cultural producer at the Welcome Galleries, Daniel Olson and myself, and with academic advisors, historian of medicine, Sandra Bhattacharya, virologist, Shahid Jamil, and physicist biologist, Mukun Tate. Allow me to introduce Dr. Ramana Reddy, a member of the board of Science Gallery Bengaluru, and at this moment, the additional chief secretary, the Department of Electronics, Information Technology, Biotechnology, and Science and Technology. He's one of the senior most bureaucrats in Karnataka and has 30 years of experience across a, across a diversity of portfolios. Dr. Ramana Reddy, please may I invite you to dedicate the exhibition and launch it. Yeah, thank you, Janavi. Greetings to one and all present at the virtual platform today. I would like to dedicate the Science Gallery Bangalore's first fully online exhibition season, The Contagion, to everyone on the front line who are tirelessly working to support us during this pandemic. We are all amidst some very challenging times, but we shall overcome this too and come out stronger as a nation. A warm welcome to all the dignitaries present here at the launch of online exhibition that explores the phenomenon of transmission of emotions, behaviors, and diseases. Warm greetings to Chairperson Dr. Kiran Mazumdar Shah and the Board of Directors of Science Gallery Bangalore, Sheila Jasanov, Professor of Science and Technology Studies from the Harvard Kennedy School, Professor Chandrima Shaha, President of the Indian National Science Academy, and Professor Wheeler. As the citizens of the world, we must make evidence-based decisions and act together to reduce the transmission of the virus. However, in order to achieve this, the public must have free and open access to validated and accurate scientific information and expert insights. It is here that Science Gallery Bangalore with its timely and responsible public engagement program on contagion plays an important role. As the government, we see it as our responsibility to empower current and future generations with the knowledge and the means to tackle future challenges. It is therefore a priority for us to establish and strengthen public institutions for learning and research. Today, I am delighted to see that the Science Gallery has emerged as an institution with a strong vision to reimagine research-based public engagement in the state and the country. Advancements in technology have transformed health, transportation, communication, energy, and manufacturing industries across the globe. These transformations in turn have changed the organization of economies and societies and fostered great co greater cooperation within the tech community through various institutions and arrangements. In the last two decades, India has achieved many milestones in the areas of science and technology. It is commendable that in a difficult year, 
government of india has managed to complete an expert driven bottom up evidence based and inclusive draft of the fifth national science technology and innovation policy 2020 the fight against covid-19 has shown us that we will take science and technology more seriously than before when we talk about snt in india karnataka is always spoken with high regards we have a very conducive atmosphere which has enabled the growth of tech and innovation premier institutions like iisc isro nal jawaharlal center for advanced scientific research raman research institution institute ncbs csir laboratories cns and many other prominent r&d centers have their establishments in bangalore we have a vision group on science and technology constituted in october 2008 under the chairmanship of the distinguished scientist bharat ratna professor c n r rao he is the advisor it is the advisory body to recommend science and technology programs relevant to the current days for the last one decade our department has provided funding to a larger number of higher education institutions and universities for encouraging research setting up centers of excellence in science and engineering education upgradation of science education related infrastructure in science colleges and for awarding several individuals for development of innovative ideas and their research publication establishment like science gallery bangalore has a mandate to empower the young in bangalore and in india the young mediators who you will all meet at the exhibition are the future ambassadors of science in our society i hope that they will inspire many more citizens to join them in conversations and collaborations around science it is indeed wonderful to know that the scientific community policy makers apex bodies and funding agencies are continuously striving to progress in various areas of arts science and technology of the ecosystem bangalore has always been recognized as science and technology capital of india and with events such as the one we witnessed today will propel us to new to reach new global heights i would urge all of you to explore the exhibition as well as share contagion as a public resource that could help us make better sense of these unprecedented times please stay home stay safe and take care thank you thank you very much dr ramana reddy and for launching and dedicating the exhibition to our frontline workers Kiran Mazumdar Shaw does not need an introduction, neither in India nor abroad. A pioneering biotech entrepreneur, a healthcare visionary, a global influencer, and a passionate philanthropist. She is the founder of Biocom, the proud recipient of two of India's highest civilian honors, the Padma Shri and the Padma Bhushan. She was also honored with um, civilian honors from various countries, Australia and France, among two among them. We are really proud to have her as the chairperson of our board of directors. May I invite you, Kiran, to give the opening remarks for the launch, please? Thank you, Janavi. Uh, let me start by welcoming the president of the Indian National Science Academy, Professor Chandrima Saha, president of the Ro Robert Koch Institute, Professor Wheeler, um, Professor Sheila Jasanov, uh, Professor um, Dale Sanders. and of course our own dr ramana reddy and my fellow board of uh, members of the board of directors of the science gallery bengaluru i would like to thank uh, everyone who has joined us here today for the launch of science gallery bengaluru's first fully online exhibition season contagion science gallery bengaluru is a new public institution whose mandate is to bridge the chasm between science and society the present pandemic emergency in india and across the world has ignited the societal interest in science people want to understand how viruses infect and spread and cause such havoc how does our immune system work and overcome the viral attack how do different vaccines work etc etc we have therefore chosen in a very timely way 
to start our online exhibition series on the theme of contagion. We have brought together not just leading scholars across disciplines to share their knowledge, but also leaders of industry and members of the public, especially young adults, to begin a critical cultural conversation around the science of pandemics. Science Gallery Bengaluru is unique in that it is the only science gallery in the global network that was set up by the government. We are indeed extremely proud of the government of Karnataka for having such vision in supporting this very important premier institution, which will play a very important role in society and science for years to come. It has been successful in bridging academia and industry together to create a public institution for research-based engagement. It is crucial to have active collaboration between government, academia, and industry, and of course, society, so that we can successfully face challenges like the current pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has actually exposed the strained relationship between science and society. Vaccine hesitancy is an example of this. Science Gallery Bengaluru and its programs will play an important role in shaping a culture of evidence-based decision-making and more importantly, scientific debate in our everyday life. Let us be led by science and scientific rationale and not by anecdotal evidence and opinions. The gallery requires support from all of us, government, philanthropists, industry, academia, and of course, all members of the public to be able to reach out and impact the lives of as many people as possible. So I do encourage you all to come and participate and share the resources of contagion widely. I also call upon the young people who are participating in the exhibition season to use this as an opportunity to engage with experts, fearlessly ask questions and think about the future. This is your platform. This is your platform to interact and ask important questions. I look forward to hearing Professor Sheila Jasanov's lecture this evening and exploring the exhibition online. I invite you all to join Science Gallery Bengaluru on a thought-provoking journey over the next 45 days as we attempt to find ways of knowing and understanding the contagion. Please stay safe and get vaccinated as soon as possible. I really want to conclude by saying, this is a very, very difficult and trying time, but let's be led by science. Let's be strong, let's be brave. And as my very dear friend, a colleague, Dr. Ramana Reddy said, let's overcome this pandemic with a sense of confidence and courage and hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiran, for your encouraging words. And of course, also for your call for vac getting vaccinated as soon as possible. Thank you, Kiran. And now on to today's lecture. Professor Sheila Jasanov is the Forzheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at Harvard Kennedy School. A crucial pioneer in her field, her work explores the role of science and technology in law, politics, and policy of modern democracies. She founded and directs the Science and Technology Studies program at Harvard. And previously, she was founding chair of the Science and Technology Studies department at Cornell. I'm very proud to share with all of you that she was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a recognition that was far, far, far long overdue. And at the same time, also elected to the American Philosophical Society. Today's lecture is supported by the Indian National Science Academy. May I please invite you, Sheila, to take over. Thank you. 
Thank you, Janavi, for the introduction and for the invitation as well. I'm truly honored to be present at this occasion at the launch of this online exhibition season on contagion. And I would like, first of all, to thank you and your team, most prominently Madhu Kamak, who's been in regular correspondence with me for the, the chance to participate in this extremely important occasion, and also to Dr. Ramana Reddy and to Kiran Mazumdar Shaw for their introductions and for their reminders how timely this entire enterprise is. And with that, let me share my screen and um, launch into uh, this evening's lecture, this morning for me. We have all become used to this particular place where Zoom rears its head and tells us what we can do and what we can't do. And the dependence on technology, which is often illustrated in these settings, is obviously a theme that has been with us for this period. Um, so as the speakers and Dr. Ramna Reddy and Karen Mazumdar Shaw and Janavi Falke herself have reminded us, we are in a moment of um, troubling um, circumstances in India. And I felt that even though I'm going to talk to you today about research, it would be inappropriate not to acknowledge uh, the situation that we're in. So this is the um, Johns Hopkins University um, statistical dashboard on which we have all been seeing the progression of the disease. And this is a snapshot I took just uh, a few hours ago, and you see that the global mortality rate has climbed above 3 million. And you see India's numbers, unfortunately, inching up there on the right hand side. It's still nothing like the numbers that have appeared in the US and in Brazil. But nevertheless, these are extremely troubling numbers. And especially at the launch of an exhibition season and with Karen Mazumda Shaw's exhortation to make this our space, this exhibition, and um, more generally the science galleries work in public communication of science and technology, it's important to remember that stories are not told only by statistics. And regardless what your particular connection is to India, and mine, of course, is very close, though I've lived in the US for the bulk of my life, it is these other kinds of pictures that are dominating our consciousness. And we are grieved beyond measure at the kinds of stories we're hearing. And I think it would be quite inappropriate for me as a scholar simply to talk about what research tells us without acknowledging that these are human beings and human lives that we're seeing devastated and the virus taking its toll through this troublesome word contagion uh, is something that we should approach with the utmost respect, respect for people who are coping with the disaster on the front lines in a way that I, in my academic citadel, can only imagine and cannot participate in. So I did not wish to begin without some words of respect for the lives that are directly affected and influenced by these things that to some extent I have the luxury of observing from a distance, but I'm not distanced, not in spirit and not in emotion. So for the last more than a year now, uh, 16 months or so, I've been engaged with colleagues in a very wide ranging study looking at public and governmental responses to the coronavirus um, in 18 countries on our side, but we have been colleagues with another group that has been looking at five countries in Africa. And just to give you an idea of the spread of this research, the countries have been highlighted on this map that you see. I've been engaged in this study as part of a team, my very distinguished and much admired co-investigator, co-leader on this project is Professor Stephen Hillgartner, 
of Cornell University, but together we have been fortunate to be assisted by two postdoctoral fellows, um, Margarita Reisberg and also Ono Osgode, and uh, a team of about 60 researchers who are located, distributed across all of these countries. And so before I present some of our results, I would like to thank Stephen Hillgartner and all of our team for participating in this attempt to make sense of this experience that the world is going through, and of course, the US and India very prominently. So here you see a different rendition of these countries divided up into continents, and you see that there is high representation in our project. We're ranging across five continents and with 18 countries, as I've mentioned, um, and with teams reporting monthly or even more frequently their knowledge and understanding from their on the ground experiences. So what I say is based on these country reports that we've been gaining and gleaning since about April of last year. So the first thing to say is something about the comparative framing and formulation of this project of ours. On the one hand, it is a pandemic and the term pan means that it's everywhere, it's worldwide. And of course the spread of the virus does not understand borders in that sense. So why should we be looking at nations instead of at a global response? And the answer is that in many ways, we've been reminded in these last 16 months or so, uh, that nations matter tremendously to the responses that we make, even to a global crisis like this pandemic. And although this is not the topic of this exhibition, you may be reminded that the world is facing another crisis, climate change, that will involve very similar kinds of interrogations of ourselves as we're organized into nation states. And so just a reminder that the territorial borders matter in the response, even if the virus doesn't recognize the borders. To date, it's the national measures that have dominated how people are responding in the policymaking world. And these national responses have tremendous international implications for individuals as well as for populations. So I was reminded recently by a fellow in my program um, who is from Australia, that his, one of his parents had traveled to the Philippines shortly before the, the outbreak became severe. And for more than a year now, this Australian citizen from the Philippines has been unable to go back to Australia because of Australia's prudent closing of its borders. But that means that citizens of the nation can even be stuck elsewhere. And I think we're all familiar with stories of that sort currently I don't know how many of my South Asian friends and colleagues, Indian friends and colleagues, have mentioned that they cannot come and be with their families because of the restrictions that have had to be put in place against the contagion. So the experiences of a nation affect the responses. And to some degree, this exhibition is a historical one. So it's also useful to remind ourselves that we're approaching the crisis with different historical understandings and um, prior experiences with what to do in these kinds of situations. And yet the fact that there are these different responses, they offer opportunities as well. They offer opportunities for us to learn from one another. And this is one of the payoffs, one of the purposes of this research project that we have been undertaking. So, to go back a little bit about experiences, um, of course, we've had outbreaks in the past, and now this time the world is approaching the outbreak with a different set of resources of computerization and data gathering. And we are reminded daily that data science is playing a very important part in our lives, as also are the communications media. So most of the major newspapers that I read have dedicated pages uh, to the coronavirus outbreak. The New York Times, for instance, has a mapping service that tells you 
weekly, if not daily, what the situation is with the virus and this map, which has the usual kind of coloration that the darker you get, the worse is the severity and intensity of the disease and of the, um, the infectivity and the death tolls. This gives you a snapshot of where the virus is lodged and to what degree. And of course we see certain patterns. I mean, so entire continents like Africa are faring very differently from Latin America. I mean, just from the spectrum of the colors, you see that in spite of the gradations within Latin America on the whole, uh, the entire continent there is much more severely affected than Africa. So while we're looking at the contagion through these kinds of maps, we're immediately led to ask questions. Why is it that although the virus is everywhere, it is not behaving in exactly the same way around the world? And of course, within India, we know that there has been a progression and different kinds of um, charts and graphs tell us about that, and I'll come to that in a moment. But the contrast between the previous map and this one is one that we should dwell on. So in this map, which is a map of the Global Health Security Index, we're looking at the ways in which countries were rated vis-a-vis -vis their preparedness to meet crises like pandemics. And here we see a very different distribution of the colors. So again, light means good and dark means bad for whatever reason the map makers have hit upon. And so from that standpoint, we see that the African continent was rated very low on the Global Health Security Index. That means that on the whole, the African continent be relatively ill-prepared, poorly prepared to meet the contagion. Whereas on the whole, North America and Europe fared well. And as we'll see, the US in fact was rated number one on the Global Health Security Index. So one might ask immediately, why is there this discrepancy between what science told us about a country's readiness to meet the virus and the facts on the ground of the country's performance once the virus did hit its borders. And this is one of the puzzles, one of the central puzzles that we've been trying to make sense of through our, our own comparative study over the last several months. So how does one even begin to compare how countries are faring? And one way is to look at numbers, but to look at numbers as fractions and not as absolute numbers. So if you look at the absolute numbers, as we saw in the Johns Hopkins map that I showed you early on, you will have seen that the US was rated top because in absolute number of deaths, the US is still leading the world, followed by Brazil, followed by Mexico and followed by India. But if you look at deaths per million, which is a fractional term, um, India is highlighted here in blue, and you see that the lineup of the countries is different. So even the USA, which in absolute terms has not been doing very well to prevent deaths from coronavirus, you see that the US in percentages in deaths per million ranks below half a dozen other countries. And for some reason, Belgium, which is a European country, and you'd expect Belgium to have the same kinds of resources as say the Netherlands or say Germany or France, but Belgium has been faring particularly poorly. Now, all of this tells us not just something puzzling that faced with facing the same virus, different countries are responding differently in their populations, biologically in different ways, different numbers of deaths per million, but it also leads you to ask questions about data collection itself. So a comparison like Belgium and the UK and the US, where you would think the same kinds of resources must obtain in terms of hospitals and hospital care, it turns out that Belgium's way of reporting cases and deaths is actually quite different from the UK and the US. So in making these comparisons and making our kind of comparative study, we have had to be sensitive 
to where these numbers come from, what are they actually measuring, and what are the indicators? I mean, so how do you know when somebody has COVID? And, you know, how do you know even when somebody is becoming vaccinated? So in our study, we've discovered that these data collection methods are part of our knowledge problem, that the data collection is not standardized and differs very greatly from country to country. Nevertheless, we know some things, and this is a sobering map because it shows us from across a span of time what is happening with the number of cases. And even in Brazil, which has been very badly afflicted, you see a drop in recent times, but the, the rise, the slope of the rise in India is most similar to the sort of slope that we've seen in the US before. And again, this is a different way of representing the data, not in absolute numbers, but as a trend and as a shape that immediately compels our attention. What are we seeing in this shape itself that warns us in a certain way? So we see that the UK has finally, after a pro problematic, troublesome start, to some degree flattened its rate. We see that Mexico is still perhaps on the rise, but not in this worrisome way of an out of control epidemic that we saw in the US at a certain point last summer and that we seem to be seeing in India now. So again, a reminder in the context of this exhibition, which is visual and it's presenting itself digitally, that we should look very carefully at the visual representations. They show us different aspects, different dimensions of what it means to be in a state of contagion. It is not one thing, it is a different set of indicators that allow us to understand the phenomenon from very different angles. Now, in our comparative study, as I've already mentioned, there are some questions that are driving us and some uh, problems that we're trying to understand in different ways. Uh, so in the study, we identified a series of puzzles and paradoxes and divergences, places where it makes a big difference which country you're looking at. Because as in any scientific study, where you see an anomaly, where you see something that is unexpected, that's where science compels our attention to enter in. So there's first of all a difference between the myth-making and the realities. And I've already pointed out that the US ranked number one in the Global Health Security Index. That's what GS GHSI stands for. But it is to date still number one in total deaths. But another point to remember at the same time about a country's capacity to respond America, as it's not a surprise to anybody in this audience, has been a kind of evangelist for democracy, saying that we are one of the oldest and maturest democracies in the world and that other people should follow the lead. And yet in the US, in the period of the virus, we have also seen democracy under tremendous attack. And this is, again, a point I will come back to. And then the outcomes are also different. I've already pointed out that in deaths per million, America, the United States ranks high, not the highest in the world. But then the difference between the US and India is also striking. But as yet, the US has more than 10 times the number of deaths per million population as India does. But is this a real number? Are the Indian numbers deflated because of undercounting and because one doesn't even necessarily know when a death is due to the coronavirus. And again, I'm sure that you will see statistics of this sort throughout the exhibition, but one has to complement one measure by other measures. So another very common measure that has sprung up during this period is looking at excess deaths over, over a period. So we have very good statistics over dozens and dozens of years about the total number of people who die in a country over a given span of time. And one can go back and take the epidemic and say, well, how do those numbers compare? And even in a very sophisticated country like the US, we see a difference between the number of coronavirus deaths actually reported 
and the numbers we get from the excess death count. So again, a repeated reminder that the indicators matter and which indicators we're looking at matter a great deal, but these also point to very big differences. And so if we compare the UK with India in terms of cumulative deaths per million, again, we see a big discrepancy. But then if we look at GDP, we see that the UK GDP is much higher. So there's no obvious correlation between the GDP of a nation and the deaths per million rate of a nation. But again, these are all to some degree fuzzy numbers and we have to um, use them as starting points for further thinking and further research. So if we look at the ways in which science has been understood by policymakers in these different countries, we find quite big differences in the way in which science advice is channeled. So I was pleased to see that the Robert Koch Institute, which is one of the oldest and most established world leaders in public health information, um, is a co-sponsor of this meeting. And in Germany, it has been one of the central sources of information. Whereas if you look at India, the prime minister has been advised by top scientists and top health experts, but these have been constituted as specific advisory bodies to the Indian government in this time. In the UK, there is a body that is uh, perhaps appropriately abbreviated SAGE, because it's supposed to be offering um, wise advice to the government. But there are other scientists in the UK who have been less than satisfied with the kind of advice the UK government is getting via SAGE. And only in the UK, there is actually a breakaway other scientific advisory body that has named itself the Indy SAGE for independent SAGE. And it's offering somewhat different policy advice from what the government is offering. So one can ask questions about the ways in which a country is receiving advice and what bearing that has on the nature of the decisions that that country will be making and is making, and how in turn does that reach back to what this exhibition season's purposes is? How does that relate back to citizens and the ways in which they are understanding the science? You've heard exhortations from both Dr. Ramana Reddy and from Kieran Mazumdar Shaw, that people should use this exhibition as ways to treat it as their knowledge space to come and glean understanding. But among the, the things that we need to understand also are the ways in which knowledge is making its way upstream to the decision makers. And this is one of the areas of difference that we've been um, investigating as well. And then last but not least, what is the relationship between citizens and the state? Does the state see its citizens as intelligent? In the Netherlands, for instance, we found that the word intelligence is actually used in the policy domain. It was used to describe the lockdown, not that it was an absolute lockdown or a stringent lockdown, but that it, it was an intelligent lockdown. And what the prime minister of the Netherlands meant by that was that the decision makers were in a kind of partnership with the citizens and they trusted the citizens to be intelligent in their understanding of the lockdown as well. By contrast in Japan, where the rates have been fortunately low and the death rates also low, we find a very high degree of stigmatization as if citizens are blaming each other if they contract the disease and this has led to difficulties in data collection and also to the treatment of people because people are afraid to explain to each other that they have been in contact with the virus because they might be ostracized. In Singapore, we've seen a pattern of on the whole trusted paternalism that on the whole people trust their government to understand what the situation is and to make the best decisions on their behalf. But even in Singapore, we've seen breakdowns uh, over the marginalized population. So the biggest outbreaks of the disease in Singapore have been among the migrant workers who are coming from South Asia. And then recently there was a controversy over an app that was supposed to be a tracking app, a digital uh, device, where the government had assured citizens that their data would be private, but it turned out that the police were using these data as well. And that has resulted in a kind of 
distrust of what the government is doing. So again, it's important in this changing, evolving emergency situation to remember that um, the way in which the state cultivates its relationship with its citizens is a very important factor in how we are dealing with the pandemic. This is just a chart actually from several months ago, but it is one of the comparative products of our project, showing how different countries are representing the phenomena to their own citizens. So in the center there, you have um, different uh, Latin American, uh, the bottom curve, for instance, in the center is from Peru. Uh, on the left, you have a couple of representations from Europe. And then on the right, you have a couple of representations from um, uh, Asia. So the very bottom right curve is the one from China. And of course, it conveys a great deal of information because China was the origin of the coronavirus, but China has also been extremely effective in stamping out the virus. And it has been one of these bellwether cases, one that we have to understand uh, to see what it takes if the virus is already established in the population, what kind of measures then have to be undertaken uh, to come to grips with it. And um, unfortunately, there's not time to dig into the background of each of these representations, um, but it's just worth pointing out that different countries are telling their publics what is going on through their own representations, which look different from one country to another. Our own investigation quickly came to the conclusion that we could not look just at the biological progression of the disease. And indeed that we needed to look at three different systems as they are interacting with one another, the health system, the economic system, and the political system. So you can see our study, the one that is based at Cornell with Steve Hilgardner and myself at Harvard as an investigation in three different parts, the interacting health, economic, and political systems. Confronting the same challenge, so the coronavirus has been depicted in various ways as an invader, but in this image, as almost an alien invader with these colorations that we associate with uh, visitors from other planets. So it's the same invader coming and lodging in these different systems. And one of the concepts that we've developed in the project is the idea of public health sovereignty. So to what extent is the virus seen as challenging a kind of state-like apparatus that most countries have erected over the last hundred years? So the current pandemic is a tragic reminder that the last time the world was in the grip of a severe pandemic of something like the same scale was almost exactly 100 years ago. Um, it's called variously the 1918 flu epidemic or the Spanish flu because of where it was thought to have originated. And the numbers of deaths and the devastation was on a far larger scale than it is today. But it is also the starting point for many ideas for how to set up public health responses in a pandemic. And people still go back uh, to images and to responses of this sort. So this is um, an emergency ward that was set up in the United States, but we've seen similar images actually in play, for instance, in New York State, when the Jacob Javits Conference Center was converted into an emergency clinic because of a wave of infections. Fortunately, they did not rise to quite the levels that people thought, but the pictures of that Javits Center are actually quite comparable to what you see here. So a question for us has been to what extent is the sovereignty of the public health system, the ability of the public health system to say, you shall stay at home, you shall socially distance yourself, to what degree is that interacting with the political system and how is politics responding to the public health emergency? So from that standpoint, we found at least back in January that there were three patterns that had emerged over the nine or 10 months of the coronavirus epidemic up to that stage. And we named them control, 
consensus, and chaos. And in that table, you see illustrations of the three different appro approaches. Now, maybe we would modify these findings and this classification somewhat, but I still think that it is a very useful classification that again, channels our attention, focuses our attention to look at certain kinds of things. So in the control countries, by and large, public health sovereignty, the ability of the public health system to come to grips with the virus prevailed. There was not much interference from politics. Often there was learning from prior epidemics. Taiwan, an island nation, is a good example of a country that achieved control. But of course, one could look at the People's Republic of China and say that that too is an example of a control country and then closer to India, New Zealand is another example of we didn't study it in our comparative study. There were payoffs from being a control country that on the whole economies did better in the control countries and the, the politics also turned out to be less disruptive than in some of the other countries that we saw, that we included in our comparison. The second pattern, consensus, was a pattern where the country was not necessarily effective at controlling the virus, neither in the first phase nor perhaps later. But on the whole, there was good agreement between citizens and others in the country about what the right responses might be. And we took Germany as a kind of paradigm case of this consensus approach. And our contention is that this is not accidental. It's not that Germany invented a political system geared toward consensus in the face of the virus. Rather, what happened was that people agreed to put their very real political differences aside because there are mechanisms for coming together around certain kinds of principles. So for instance, in Germany, we saw that there was quite a lot of attention in the economic system toward preserving jobs so that after the virus left, the jobs would still be there and people would be able to take up where they started. Whereas in America, which we took as a paradigm case of a chaos country, the approach was very different. It was to let people become unemployed, but give them unemployment benefits. But as we're seeing now, even when the economy comes back to life, as we hope it will in this year, um, there's no guarantee that people will find jobs or the same jobs. So one sector that has been extremely adversely affected is the holiday recreation restaurant sector, and people are not going to get those jobs back. So what the economy will look like coming forward is to some degree still one of these unexamined questions that we're still doing research on. Important for this exhibition, we also identified two somewhat discrete packages of intervention. So it's, one says public policy, but public policy itself takes a variety of different forms. And one can see that the modes of intervention either focused on the virus or they focused on the social practices, or in the ideal case on both. But to some degree, the ways in which the problem was framed from the start, what are we looking at here, uh, differs depending on whether you're targeting the virus or targeting the human bodies in which the virus has become embedded. So the initial frame for targeting the virus was like that picture I showed you. The virus is a foreign invader. I might even have said an alien inv invader in a sense. And when that is the focus of your public policy, then you erect boundaries and borders. And so the border controls are part of a series of activities that were trying to keep the virus out uh, away from human bodies. And you can go down that table and look at these differences. Uh, for those who are interested, um, I will uh, show uh, our website at the very end of this talk. And, and there you will find a downloadable uh, paper in which you will find tables like this laid out if you're interested in following this up. In this up. And if uh, one of the organizers wishes to put the um, um, the URL in the chat, you know, please feel free to do that from the compcoreproject.cornell.edu. 
So while we were doing this research, we found lots of conventional wisdom about how to tackle a pandemic. And by and large, we found that there were some important fallacies. Uh, so especially last year, everybody was talking about the uh, playbook to tackle an epidemic. And so the first sort of presumption was that you can hand over a playbook, a play-by-play -play designation of what the public health, health authorities should be doing to manage the plague. And it turned out that those kinds of playbooks are not very useful. Partly because it's not the same war each time and the lessons you've inherited from the prior war do not necessarily hold up in this one. Secondly, everybody expected that politics would be shelved and people would be listening to the health authorities and it was an emergency and therefore policy is what would be important. And across our countries, we found that this was a fallacy. In some countries, there was indeed a kind of suspension of politics as usual. This was true in our consensus countries and our control countries, but not in our chaos countries. Thirdly, indicators of success and failure are clear. So at the beginning of my talk, I showed that uh, the indicators are actually multiple and varying. How can you tell whether a country is doing well or badly? Well, it depends on what indicators you're using. And it turns out that the success and failure indicators are not clear cut and outcomes cannot be well-defined or objectively measured. Fourthly, people thought that science advisors would bring rationality into government. And I've already indicated that the science advisory road is, is conceived differently in the different countries and therefore science advisors have not been able uh, to uh, always point the decision makers to the best possible decisions. And I think in India, you've seen some of these discrepancies between what public health experts are saying one should be doing and what decision makers have allowed their publics to do in a certain sense. And lastly, the idea that if you don't trust the experts, that means you must be ignorant of the science. This turns out to be a deep and profound fallacy. And I'll go into that for a couple of minutes in the concluding um, period of my talk. So this is what I want to turn to next and in a sense last. So we are living in a century now, the 21st century, which is dominated by expertise, that there is hardly anything in our lives which we can do without experts. And Dr. Raman already pointed out right at the beginning that Bengaluru, where this exhibition is taking place, is the science and technology capital of India, according to many measures. So most citizens of Bengaluru and most people watching um, this talk or coming to this exhibition will not need to be reminded that expertise matters, that scientific knowledge matters. But how do we relate expertise to politics? And here I want to say that this is a kind of diagram that we should be keeping in our minds. So India is a democracy. The United States is a democracy. People often say that the history of the 20th century was toward greater and greater democracy or democratization. And there has been a key question that democracies have to address, which is why should the few, the elected few be empowered to rule the many? Why do we trust uh, a small number of people sitting at the tops of our governments uh, to make decisions for the rest of us. But one could equally say that in modern times, there's another key question, and that is about knowledge. Why should the few be empowered to know for the many? We're not all scientists, we're not all public health experts, and yet over the last almost year and a half by now, we have been controlled by the knowledge of these few people. And it's very important in our political systems to address this question. Who are these people? Why are they empowered? Which ones should we believe? And how should we uh, put our trust in them or not? My own argument in my research is that we have almost a system of parallel constitutions, that we have a constitution that is about political delegation. It addresses the question, why should the few be authorized to rule for the many? And there are many subordinate questions we ask 
in that constitutional system. First of all, is power being exercised? And then are these authorized powers? Is the government going beyond what we have told them they can go? Are there limits to what governments can tell us to do? How do we know those limits? We know that countries don't agree on this. For instance, China for a number of decades imposed a limit on family size. It's the only country that has done that on a nationwide scale through the one child policy. Now they have lifted the one child policy. But one could ask, well, what were the limits and how did we know them? Who can challenge them? By what processes? And are they represented? Are these people represented? And if so, by whom? But we can equally say that in the modern world, there are questions of epistemic delegation, the knowing for the few, which are implicit. And here we can also ask certain questions, which my hope is that this exhibition allows people to explore. So in a world without borders, who is authorized to know for us? Does it make sense to talk about epistemic subsidiarity, that it is okay to know and understand and measure and record things differently in different parts of the world and even in different parts of countries? How do we think about the future? So the present, the political delegations are mostly about the present. What about futures and how do we think about them? And how do we construct expertise? Whose responsibility is it to convey knowledge. These questions lead to a set of ideas that are about the constitutional role of science and expertise. And I will just leave this as a set of propositions uh, that are widely believed that you can't have accountability without science. But then we have also discovered that science is not immune to politics, it is very much embroiled in and caught up in politics. If you get the mix of science and politics wrong, you can have a set of responses that completely cut against the words of Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, which were go and get vaccinated as soon as possible. Because in America, but also in many other countries, we are seeing a phenomenon of vaccine hesitancy or reluctance uh, as represented in this photograph. And it matters, it matters on a countrywide basis. And we can see, for instance, that this picture in Kuwait shows a very orderly implementation of public health sovereignty with everybody sitting carefully, social distancing, uh, lines upon lines of people being extremely obedient. Whereas, this is an evocative picture from the state of Michigan in the United States, accusing the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, named in that poster, of being in effect a Nazi for carrying out her gubernatorial responsibilities in response to public health advice. So here you see two countries with completely different responses of how the political system and the public health system will respond. How will political sovereignty and the citizen respond to this matter of public health expertise? I've already mentioned that um, our research is summarized on a website and please feel free to visit it. Um, a recent article that Steve Hilgartner and my other colleague, Benjamin Hilbert and I wrote in Science Magazine deals with some of these questions. If you go to our website, you will be able to download that article. And with that, let me again thank you for this opportunity to speak on this important occasion of the launch of Contagion. I unfortunately have to leave immediately for another engagement, but it has been a privilege and an honor, Janavi, to be present at this launch. And I would like to thank all of the organizers enormously for the opportunity and for the educational benefits that you are bringing to Bengaluru and beyond to the entire world. Thank you very much. It's been fantastic. You've given us a lot to think about as usual.
And I have put the links to the study as well as to the report in the chat box. So those of you who are interested, please uh, go look at it. Thank you again, Sheila, and with all good wishes uh, from Bangalore. Hope to see you soon. I, with this, our exhibition is formally open. I want to thank the many people who've made this exhibition possible, the artists and contributors and speakers and facilitators, numbering 68, who all of whom you will get to meet over the next 45 days. I'd love for all of you to fill the feedback form so that we know what it is you expect and what it is we can do better and what it is that you'd like to see happen in the next 45 days. We have room for dynamic programming. Our website, the exhibition website, nowtransmitting.com will be live very shortly. And with this, the exhibition is open. You will also get to see a fully uh, replicated Canada website of the exhibition. So those of you who, have, who are more familiar with the Kannada language will be able to see the exhibition in that language too, with some of the programming also being conducted in Kannada. Last but not least, I would like to name our partners who have made this exhibition possible. I named our two content partners, which is the Robert Koch Institute. And thank you, Professor Wheeler and Esther Maria for uh, all the support you've offered us so far. The John Innes Center, uh, who have been wonderfully supportive of our works right since our previous exhibition, Phytopia. Alongside, we also have some very, very prominent and eminent program partners who we are proud to associate with. The DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, who are supporting all of the workshops and masterclasses for young adults, which will be running with the speakers and the artists through the 45 days. The Indian National Science Academy and Professor Chandra Mashaha, who have supported the public lecture series, including this lecture. The Chennai Photo Biennale Foundation, with whose support we have launched a public call for photographs of the pandemic, which will be um, chosen, a sort of, well, a selection of those photographs will be soon online for everyone to see. Uh, again, our sort of repeat supporters who have been with us, in fact, right since our second exhibition, and this is our fourth, the United States Consul General in Chennai, for their continuing support for our programming. And finally, a very important partner, the Jenner Trust, uh, with whose support we will be able to see glimpses into the life and work of Edward Jenner, and which is, which is showcased at their museum, which, which sheds light on the very first attempts at vaccination uh, and the stories therefrom. So thank you again, everybody, for taking the time to be with us this evening. The exhibition is now live and we look forward to seeing all of you in the coming 45 days for our programming to visit us again. Thank you very much.